Aloha, and welcome to another episode of Talk Story with John Wahe. And as usual, I think we have another very interesting guest and topic for us to talk uh, to talk uh, about this afternoon. I have with me the new president of the Northeast Asia Economic Forum, and her, and her, it's a Dr. Denise Conan. And she is also, in addition to being a doc, uh, a uh, the president of the Northeast Asia Economic Forum, she's also the dean at the University of Hawaii Manoa School of Social Social Science. College of Social Sciences. College of Social Sciences. So I mean, this is a big deal, and so here she is today, and so uh, welcome, uh, Dean. Welcome, Denise. Mahalo. And Thank you, Governor. Congratulations on being the new president. Tell us a little bit about what the Northeast Asia Economic Development Forum is about, or the Economic Forum is about. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, so, so, yeah, the Northeast Asia Economic Forum has been around since 1991. We were just uh, celebrating our 30th anniversary and the purpose of the forum, you know, it was, it was founded by, um, Dr. Lee J. Cho, who, um, some of your viewers might, might remember in different ways. He was long affiliated with the East West center. He was a vice president at the East West center, and he was also director of their, um, Institute for, um, population studies, uh, for right. many years. And the Northeast Asia Economic Forum, the real vision of it is that that region of China, Japan, Korea, Russia, Mongolia, and the United States, especially Hawaii and Alaska, is so pivotal uh, in economic terms. But traditionally, there has also been a lot of political uh, uh, tensions in the region. Um, and so the goal was to foster people to people dialogues over the continuity of time that all that contribute to economic development. So where there may be disagreement around political issues, we can agree that we want to have economic cooperation. We can agree that we want prosperity for our people. Um, so it's been very successful with a number of different programs we can talk about. But, but uh, you know, it's it's like um, that region, sort of pivotal, you know, it, it's like Northern Asia in a way, as opposed to ASEAN in, in, in the South, but it has its own uh, qualities and, and differences and, and expressions. I mean, yes. for, first of all, you, you, you got China in the mix, you got the UA, UA, uh, USA, which is going through its own relationship uh, with the worries with China. You got Japan, a longtime ally. You got Korea. And, and this forum, as I understand it, and as you're explaining, it seems brings all of these diverse actors, including Alaska, by the way, and Russia, together yes. in, in trying to work uh, on mutual uh, problems of mutual or trying to develop projects of mutual interest for everybody. Now, the forum was founded by Lee J. Cho, which you just mentioned, Dr. Lee J. Cho, and um, which he, as, you, as you also mentioned, he was a long time member, uh, a long time, um, I guess you would say professor, some, he was a scholar at the, at the East West Center and it was his vision that somehow all of this, I guess, would, you know, ultimately it was about peace and prosperity. Correct, for yes. the region yes. and for Hawaii. And so I, I know that uh, one of the tools that he used to, to, to achieve that vision was he used to have these regular yearly conferences that brought in people from all over these experts from all over from these from this entire region to discuss things together so give me a little bit about how that all works you know oh comes, i'll tell you does. i'll tell you about that 
Um, so, well, first, let me just say a, a little bit about Dr. Cho and his um, vision, how that happened. I mean, he, he is Korean ancestry, but was actually born in Japan during wartime. And he also had the ex experience with the Korean War as well. Returned to Korea. He, he is uh, fluent in uh, multiple languages, Korean and Japanese. Japanese is his original tongue, Chinese, and speaks some Mongolian, some Russian. So he, his linguistic ability to communicate across these cultures was really amazing, but his, his under, and, and he is, as you say, he was a, a tremendous researcher in the area of population studies. And I think his, his insight was important that if, if people would know one another and be able to talk through some of the difficult issues that we have, some of the complications and challenges that this would lead to more peace and economic prosperity and stability in the region. And that Hawaii is in this unique position that we can be a sort of a neutral broker for all these forces from the, even from the US, from, from China, Japan, Korea, there's a, there's a way that we can bring our, um, you know, a neutrality to these hard discussions. So as you said, one of the core activities, two of the core activities that he did, one was to run a, um, he launched a young leaders program that is very successful. And we must give a lot of credit to the Freeman Foundation for its continual support of this, of the young leaders program. Tell us so, about that. How, yeah. how does it work and how are people selected and what are some of the, uh, some of the graduates, you know? Well, it's exciting. So the, the, the young leaders program is, um, includes, 25 to 30 leaders from the different countries. They're nominated by um, affiliates of the Northeast Asia Economic Forum. And there, there's also, um, there's a Asia Pacific Institute in, in Korea. There's an Asia Pacific Institute in Japan. We have a similar organization in China. And so those organizations help to solicit really top emerging leaders. Uh, to this program. These are, these are young people under the age of 40, and they come together for a 10-day experience in many different parts of the world. We rotate around the region. And a benefit is that they're working uh, together, they're learning about the region, but also about some of the economic issues that are, are facing um, across, across regional. We bring in senior scholars um, to um, to help with this. And the experience of being able to develop that kind of network really has been transformational for the graduates. And, and some of the graduates, uh, I understand that, for example, uh, Senator Chang. Uh, Stanley from, Chang was one of our graduates. Yes. yes, so he went through the program and he's certainly a distinguished graduate uh, locally. Um, and let me see, we've had We've had graduates that have gone on to be ambassadors for their countries, um, you know, and, and um, in various high level positions. Of course, and, uh, we're trying to get a whole of society, business, government, academics. I, I, and I'm assuming that you keep in touch. They, they sort of they keep in touch with the Northeast Asia Forum, which is- a, We do, a, and, and it's a positive thing. Very positive, and it's an advantage then when we go to um, the countries that we have that ready network there. And we have such a strong, um, not only the young leaders, we have a strong network of, of senior leaders, really high Yeah, they level grow up, you know, in 30, years, in 30 years, some of those young leaders got to be big you know, older big time leaders. Right? Exactly. So we're able to, they had such a positive experience in that, um, that we're able to call on them to, um, you know, bring their expertise to bear. Um, and it's been, a, it's been, I think, positive for um, the region. And Okay, and for okay so what's the, you said there were two, two basic programs. What's the second? 
Well, a second is we have a um, we we have various working groups and we have a senior senior leaders conference that um, um, we're actually running that um, annual conference right right now virtually this year. Usually that's an in person gathering, but um, for example, this year we're focused on our annual conference is focused on some really pivotal issues and timely issues of dialogue. Um, just yesterday, you and I, thank you for coming. Uh, we're oh, in a session. Very much. And, um, you know, it's interesting because Saturday we just wrapped up COP26 and our session yesterday was on how do we achieve carbon neutrality? Well, okay. Uh, COP26, why don't you explain that to our, uh, our listeners, because not everybody may know what you're oh, talking about. Oh, okay, if you, okay. Yeah, Just tell, in, in brief, you know, if you haven't been following the news on climate change, um, scientists are, are recommending that we need to set um, limits to greenhouse gas emissions so as to achieve uh, 1.5 uh, uh, increase in, in temperature. Um, and so that means really drastically changing our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, and so negotiations have just concluded. It didn't, it, it had um, many good things. It didn't have everything that we would want to see. There were some compromises in that agreement. Um, but the... Um, so we these were, people it, all came together with government leaders and everything in, I know, Europe, right? Some Scotland, a, right? Scotland, and right. and they discussed Glasgow. these issues and came out with right. an agreement. So forth, came out right. with an agreement, but and then the the practical side is well, okay, that's you know there's the political side to it, but how do we actually implement um, uh, changes in energy infrastructure? And so what is helpful about our dialogues is we we have representation from highest levels of research scholars in the countries. Um, the, the, um, the, the former executive vice president of Hitachi from Japan, for example, uh, Yasuo Tanabe. Uh, we had Minister Kyunghwan Ju from Korea. Um, so we, and we had, we had um, a um, scholar from Tianjin University Che Zhang Zhang from China. Um, giving and you also had somebody from uh, Terry Searles, sales from Terry Searles from, from USA. And um, so we were able to get, you know, the first time I have heard inside information on what is China's plan. Um, how does this, how does China's plan link to the One Belt, One Road initiative? Um, how are they going to transition from, you know, they, they've been adding more coal fire power plants. How, how are they going to actually reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in a, in a rapid way, or are they? And um, so it was fascinating to hear in detail um, how they're thinking about this. Uh, and, and for not just to hear that, but to allow, um, you know, the, the uh, consulate of Japan to ask the questions of what questions Japan has about that regarding, you know, um, yeah, attending so this th these conference. kind of dialogues are so important. Oh, they're absolutely, and it's so exciting. I did want to make a distinction. So we had, there was this meeting in Scotland where the yes. political leaders in the world set standards to be achieved. And the day Correct. after that, at your, uh, at the Northeast, uh, Asia Economic Forum, you have these people who are con who are in a way the uh, the staff behind the decisions that were made in Scotland come to your uh, conference and give you an insider's look as to how these these uh, goals will be made, met. And like that was very precious. Oh, and to have a candid dialogue between them where they could ask their questions. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Really valuable. Uh, the challenge right now is that we're doing it virtually when in person you're able to even have more benefits from that sort of um, relation. But for many of these 
many of these leaders, senior leaders, um, we've developed, Dr. Cho has developed relationships over the course of, of decades. And that makes a difference with trust that, that these, um, well, these people can actually talk candidly and ask each other questions. I mean, it, it, as you were starting to say before I, I clarified the, the, the two meanings is that uh, people like from China, can you imagine a person that advises the prime minister of Japan on energy policy, being able to talk to a leading Chinese scholar about the goals that China set in order to meet representations at this international forum and ask questions right. of, like you just and said. Ask like, questions how, how... And be candid about the challenges because they mutually face challenges. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And and it, 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 it's amazing to me that, um, that that could happen. I mean, you, you were just talking about the fact that China has been increasing its usage of coal and yet now has set a goal where they're going to have to do something about that and to hear a candid discussion that that's not going to be easy but they're going to be trying it i think that's fascinating we're going to need to take a break right now and we'll be right back uh to follow up on the discussions and also what you have planned for the second half of your conference and uh, where you think we ought to, you'll be going in the future with all of this. So I appreciate. Uh, thank you, Governor. Thank you. Welcome back to the second half of Talk Story with John Waihe and Dr. Denise Conan from the, uh, well, she carries many hats, but the, she's also Dean of the College of Social Sciences at the University of Hawaii. But most importantly for today's discussion and in many ways, maybe for the future of uh, the planet, <laughs> if I can't be so bold, uh, she is the president of the Northeast Asia Economic Forum. So you know, for me, as a observer at the meeting uh, this past weekend, uh, it was absolutely fascinating to uh, be able to, to hear the exchange of ideas. And in the past, one of the things that was really nice about having in-person meetings was actually studying participate as, as well but nevertheless it, it was very informative i mean so well, okay you. We went, you you went through all of that and what happens what happens to what they discussed and how is it incorporated into whatever and what's the i know you're going to have another meeting next sunday because of the way we have to do this virtual thing uh, and what happens next sunday i mean what are we talking about next oh, sunday? okay so uh, well, there's a few things I, I want to say, and I and I also want to note, Governor, that you you were with um, NIAF since the beginning, since 1991, when you were governor, and so you've seen this through the course of time and how influential it can be, yes. and how the longevity of relationships really make a key, difference, because people are at a very high level are quite committed to the success of this initiative. They see that it's high stakes. They see that there are not other forum like this. It's surprising, but who else would host a forum like this? It would be seen, if it were in Japan, it would be seen as biased to Japan. If it were in China, it would be biased to China. We're able to provide a neutrality that that the region really values and needs, which is part of the beauty of this forum. So and part then, of what Hawaii's mission ought to be to the world, I think. It would be great to see that expanded and we'd love to uh, build on this with partners who wanna support the effort. 
Um, so next, next week, next, uh, next week, we are having um, a very exciting topic. Um, as I talk to my colleagues in the region, one of the top issues they, they said was on their plate was the issue, partly the issue of supply chains, the, the challenge that we're having that we don't have products on the shelf. We're not able to get things into the, uh, surprisingly, what they're saying is that it's partly linked to COVID, but it's also linked to the high tension between China and Japan. I was stunned right. to hear that. I'm a trade economist, so I'm you know used to thinking about international trade issues. I I do consulting for you know uh, World Bank and and on issues of the World Trade Organization WTO. Um, so what's happening is that because of the trade wars and friction between China and the U.S., it's it's pushing the partner countries Korea and Japan. To, to sort of bifurcate their, their exports, right? Some ex wow. instead of producing one kind of export of say an automobile, they have to do a version for China, version for US. It's made everything really hard. And if we can't have Chinese parts in the vehicle, that then also becomes really hard. So the fact that we have issues with, I mean, look for those looking to buy a car, you see, oh, it's very hard right now supplies are not there but they're well, that's amazing. all linked together with the fact that us and china we're, we're 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 sort of forcing you know these countries do they choose we'll go with us or we go with china or do they try to do both of them whatever it is it's really increasing the cost and complication of production and so that's what we're going to talk about next next week from well, the that's top exciting. officials. You know, people, I mean, in, in a real way, this is a real problem. I mean, right now. It's a problem right now about to buy Christmas presents. And, yeah, exactly. Inflation. Inflation is driven by this. Um, you know, you want to buy, uh, trying to buy a vehicle, even the price of used cars are going up because we can't get new cars. And it's very real, very real so issues. This, uh, and, 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 and and uh, and it's affecting um, it's affecting the average family in Hawaii as it is in the rest of the United States. And most Correct. people don't understand the they don't understand the nexus between what you just described and the cost of living that is uh, increasing. Right, that's amazing. You, right. Hey, folks, you heard it first here. <laughs> you know, on this show. Yes. And and and, and it's amazing to me because. My wife and I were just talking about that this morning, and she was saying, you know, there were this is and so forth, but I there was no linkage to directly like this. So no, next, we don't think about of, that. Next half mm -hmm. of the conference is when uh, we're going to you're going to be discussing this issue. That's correct. Well, I tell right. you what, I, there is a symptom of it because um, one of the things that China has done well in is uh, produce uh, solar solar panels and has developed uh, a, a, uh, a found very good foundation for solar energy, which many of Hawaii solar companies use their equipment to to do what they uh, to fulfill their contracts in Hawaii. And I was just recently told by the uh, the the. Uh, uh, by the, a member of the P Public Utilities Commission, that they all of these people are asking for extensions of their contracts because there is this impossibility of fulfilling it because they can't get parts from China. Exactly. So I guess this is all part. So you all are related, just... all very related. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. And so tell me, who are some yeah. of the people? Similar, people similar mind? issues for for batteries similar issues for batteries for the EVs, right? Coming from right. China. Um, similar issues for um, computer chips from Taiwan and the now rising tensions with Taiwan and China. These things are all, so they, there's political aspects that then turn into real economic issues and, and um, so your yeah, forum, that, uh, your discussions <laughs> are among these experts to find a middle way 
to use the phrase, exactly. to find a, another another way to to deal with these issues, really human issues, and at the same time recognize the, the political forces that uh, are at play. Um, so you, I'm assuming you will have the same kind of intensive discussion that you had. Uh, I hope you can join energy. us. Oh, I, I'll be there, yeah. definitely. I don't, I don't want to miss it. You know, we only got a few minutes left, and I wanted to ask if you have anything else you, you wanted to add. Well, I did want to say that we had to put the uh, Young Leaders Program on hold because of COVID for some time. But we're really very much hoping to open the Young Leaders Program this coming summer, and we've decided to hold it right here in in Honolulu in Hawaii. So our goal is to uh, make that opportunity available and maybe some people would want to participate in in our young leaders program. There's an application process that we'll put out shortly about that. And it really is a fabulous program and opportunity to become um, you know, a part of a, a part of this kind of network uh, and engage with others from around the region. Well, Dean, I want to thank you so much uh, for being on, uh, on our show this afternoon. Um, it's very stimulating subjects that you you know you deal with, and I wish that there was a way that more people uh, could have the benefit of uh, well the knowledge that you are uh, accumulating and some of the strategies and things that are being. Thank discussed. you. Thank you. So, We're exploring that, how to make it more visible, but we so appreciate your support. Thank you. And we want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. And again, our appreciation to Dean Denise Conan from the University of Hawaii, who is president of the Northeast Asia Economic Forum. Aloha, everybody. See you in two weeks. Mm -hmm.